la voy a presentar. Antígona no pudo estar aquí en este momento, pero ahorita debe venir en camino, entonces me toca a mí la semblanza. Este, Cristina Ricci es la directora científica de la Oficina de Investigación y Análisis del Programa de Exploración del Sistema Solar en el Laboratorio de Propulsión a Chorro de la NASA. Eh, la doctora Ricci proporciona orientación y capacitación a la comunidad científica sobre las mejores prácticas para la presentación y revisión de propuestas. Además, Cristina es una de las líderes del proyecto científico de la misión Europa Clipper, donde organiza las actividades de, del grupo que trabaja en la ciencia del proyecto y sirve como enlace entre los grupos temáticos de trabajo y los grupos focales. Antes de unirse a la NASA en el JPL en 2018, Cristina trabajó en la sede de, de la NASA como oficial de programas y asesora científica adjunta para investigación y análisis. Eh, Cristina ha ocupado varios puestos de liderazgo y ha participado activamente en la educación y comunicación pública de la ciencia. Es una líder premiada en el tratamiento de políticas y protocolos contra el acoso. Sus esfuerzos dentro de la comunidad para crear entornos seguros e incluyentes han sido citados por las principales agencias de noticias. La doctora Richie se desempeña actualmente como la presidenta previa y miembro del Comité de la Sociedad Astronómica Americana sobre el Estado de la Mujer en la Astronomía y fue anteriormente copresidente del Subcomité de Cultura y Clima Profesional de la División de Ciencias Planetarias, también de la DOM. Y es miembro del grupo de trabajo eh, del Telescopio Espacial Hubble para hacer las, la revisión de propuestas, hacerlas anónimas. Ha sido galardonada con un premio del, del Servicio Especial de, las, de, de NASA en 2014 por su trabajo dentro de la Comunidad de Ciencias Planetarias. En 2015, la doctora Richie recibió el premio al, al Servicio Meritorio de Carrera de el American Physical Society, eh, el premio Harold Mazursky. Bienvenida. Thank you. Gracias. Hola. As I stated yesterday, that is about all the Spanish I know. So this talk will be in English today. I hope that is okay with everyone. If it is not, I'm sorry. You have lots of pictures to look at. Okay. We're going to talk about EDI in science today. I'm going to define EDI for you here in a moment, but I want to show you a couple things here on the title slide. First, I need to read something that uh, comes with doing this type of research. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and does not constitute or imply its endorsement by the United States government or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or the California Institute of Technology. You all get to blame me for this talk, so you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, my Twitter handle's up there. In case you want to tweet anything from this, you are welcome to take pictures. We are on YouTube right now. Hello, YouTube. Um, there are two different publications that are mentioned here. The first was our 2017 paper for our team. This team is actually half um, astrophysics and planetary scientist and half social scientist uh, who work together to understand the workplace climate uh, in planetary science and astronomy. Our 2017 paper focused on women of color within the field, and our paper that will be published, like it, it's already been accepted and it should be going out the door sometime in the next week, is on the LGBT um, QPAN plus results we have from our paper. So please be on the lookout for that. Okay, let's go ahead and define EDI. Equity, when you work to improve it, this promotes justice, impartiality, and fairness within procedures, processes, and the distribution of resources by institutions and systems. So when you're tr tackling equity issues, this requires an understanding of the underlying or root cause of disparities within our system. You have to understand why there is a lack of diversity and how you can combat that, how you can try to mitigate that. Diversity represents a broad representation of a community's demographics, taking into account elements of human difference, focusing on racial and ethnic groups, so sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, disabilities, religion, age, and perspectives arising from different backgrounds. This talk will not solely focus on gender diversity today. We will be talking about diversity on a much larger scale than that. But I do know that UNAM is having very serious questions, very serious conversations about gender diversity 
right now. Inclusion refers to the degree in which diverse individuals are able to participate fully in the decision-making process within an organization. You can have a diverse group and not be inclusive. You can have all of the underrepresented groups sitting at the student level and have all of your deans be the majority group. That is not considered an inclusive group. You may have diversity on a whole, but you don't have it on each leadership rung within the organization. So a lot of people think the E stands for equality, not equity. But I would like to tell you that equality is not the answer. So this image here of the bicycles shows the difference between equality and equity. So let's line up four individuals, each with unique human characteristics for them. And now let's give them all the exact same bicycle and say, this is your path to work each day. If you are in a wheelchair, can you use the same bicycle as a six-foot basketball player? No. So equality does not service everyone there. It does not give everyone the same equal opportunity to thrive. Equity is providing resources that help on each individual's unique characteristics. It's putting people onto an equal and equitable platform. So we want equity, we don't want equality. And you'll notice there's one letter missing here. And I'll be honest with you, the letter is missing on my fault, actually. Um, accessibility is not a part of this talk today. So usually you hear about DEIA or you hear about EDI. Accessibility is a really hard topic to cover within one hour when you're talking about the rest of EDI. There's a lot of policies and procedures that need to be adapted and developed to really understand accessibility on the whole for an entire institution. I'd love to give you that talk on another day, but today we're gonna focus on EDI. <clears throat> so, demographics. There's many different ways to, to tackle um, understanding issues of EDI within an institution. And one of the ways that we understand diversity is by collecting demographic in information. This, both broadly and within just subfields and departments, by collecting this information, this will tell you about any issues you have with diversity in any one subset. So I'm going to show you some of the demographic slides that have come out of the United States within the fields of planetary science and astronomy, because that is primarily the groups that I am working with right now. This is the demographics within planetary science in the United States. So this figure is by Julie Rathbun's team, uh, and it has input from Fran Bagenal's 2011 Planetary Science Workforce Survey, and it has info from the 2010 United States Census and the 2050 projections of the United States population. So in purple here, we have the planetary science community's racial demographics data. We are 86% white, about eight, seven to eight percent Asian, and less than one percent black and Hispanic. Compared to the U.S. population, which is only 60-ish, probably 64 percent white, only five to six percent Asian, and over 10 percent, and over 15, this is actually 13 and 16 percent, black and Hispanic. So we do not have the same racial demographic mix as the United States. So the available people to be part of this society are not there. Instead, what we see is a bulk majority of white members of the planetary science community in the United States. In terms of gender, we, the United States population is sitting at 50-50 male-female, and yet the planetary science community is only 26% women and 74% male, uh, men. If you look at that compared to the percentage of women on NASA science mission teams within the planetary science division, here this dotted line is that survey data you saw 
of the population of women that was identified within the field. So this is available women in the field here. So 26%, right? Here you see all of the different missions that have been selected by NASA and the percentage of women on those mission teams. Does anybody see something wrong with this chart? Other than a couple examples, we are mostly underrepresenting women on NASA science missions. These two over here are the Icarus Editorial Review Board. Icarus is the major publication for planetary science, right? This was without foreign nationals and this was with foreign nationals. This was 2016 when this was done. We had one woman as a foreign national editor for Icarus, that was it. Now we have a woman in charge as, as actually the, the main editor, which is great, but it does not lead to a percentage that is clearly indicative of where the community is. Looking at academic departments and looking at gender demographics within academia for female professors of all rank, and I chose all rank instead of full professors because if we want full professors, these numbers would plummet. So this was me trying to be as nice as possible. <laughs> so for all ranks, for the top 50 US departments, 50% is up here. This is the US population, right? Here's astronomy from 2002, 2005, 2007, and 2012 in yellow. We're sitting below 20% at all ranks. Here's earth science, we're just at 20%. Here's chemistry, well below 20%. Here's physics, right around 10%, all ranks. Now, if we look at racial demographics for the United States, and we look at physics, we don't actually have this data readily available in a really high advanced level for astronomy, but I actually got it for the physics stuff from the American Institute of Physics, sorry, the APS, the American Physical Society's uh, website. If you look, the black bars here are the US population um, for ages 20 to 24, which is right around when you finish your bachelor's degree in the United States and you start your graduate work. So this particular population subgroup was the best representation of these two groups here. You have percentage of bachelors in blue and percentage of PhDs in red and this is across different racial groups that we have. Whites for physics are getting over 70%, even though they are under 60% of the US population here. Asians are also overrepresented within the physics community, but Hispanics, blacks, and Native Americans are all massively underrepresented in the physics communities. And when you look at racial demographics in academia for those top 50, sure. Yeah. This? Oh, th oh this one? That percentage is. Sorry, that percentage is not correct. I don't know why that X is there, actually. Um, this is the one we want, 24% here. Well, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 sorry, this is the correct one. Ignore this. I don't know why this axis is here. I actually stole this. No, everybody is on the same scale here for these demographic data. So I guess, I guess you're right. The writers that are not so high mm -hmm. that they, they report them in the scale. So they fit the percentage. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. These, that's, uh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, you think I would have known this before I got up here. Um, so everybody from uh, this side, a Native American, Black, Hispanic, and Asian, are on this scale. Everybody here, the, the white population, are on this scale. Because if we had put this at its proper scale, it would be up there in the ceiling. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at the racial demographic data in academia for the top 50 US departments for black professors all ranks. Now remember that uh, black individuals make up 13% of the US population. 
This chart maxes out at 8%. Sociology is almost at 8%. Astronomy is sitting at 2%. Chemistry below 2%. Earth science just above 1% and physics below 1%. For Hispanic population, which remember that this is 16% of the total US population, more if you go to the age 20 to 24 bracket, this scale is maxed out at only 7% here instead of 16. Chemistry is currently sitting just under 4%, astronomy is under 3%, earth science and physics are just under 3%. And that is fiscal, that's the last fiscal year there, 2012. That is not me going back to like say 2002 where there was less than 1%. And if you look at the Native American populations, which are right around 1% of the US population, again, the max cell scale is 0.4% here. We're sitting below 0.25% in earth science and we're sitting well below, we're sitting at 0.05%. There's literally one, one professor of any rank that is Native American in the top 50 United States departments right now for physics. Okay? We do it through a census in the United States. It's actually defined you self identify within both the census of the United States and within when you go to be employed within an institution. Yeah. Um, mixed race makes up. Um, a smaller percentage of the United States to the error bars that we were working with here. So, okay, for racial demographics in academia, for underrepresented, fe underrepresented minorities, female professors of all ranks at the top 50 US institutions, I couldn't give you percentages because this is so low. When you become more intersectional, when you look at two marginalized groups, so in this point we're looking at groups that are both underrepresented racially and underrepresented by gender, then you get to the point where the percentages are all well below 1%. In this case, we just moved to whole numbers. And if you look at astronomy, we currently, as of fiscal year 12, we had none. We had, I think we have two now. Um, if you look at physics, four. Four and one assistant. So, so there's a large population that is missing from academia, at least within the professor ranks in the United States. So collecting demographic information at all levels is one way to gather and understand diversity. But collecting proper data from workplace climate surveys and using that data to analyze your workplace environment is one way to understand issues with inclusion and equity. And this is what I've been focusing on. I haven't been focusing on the demographic data with my own personal research. I focus on the workplace climate surveys. I'm gonna give you guys some definitions here real quick. Unconscious or implicit bias is attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding and actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. And this occurs regardless of the dominant group. So for gender, both men and women downplay women's contributions. For race, both whites and minorities downplay minorities' contributions. And if you wanna learn more about implicit bias, I highly recommend going to the training on the Kerwin Institute's website from The Ohio State University. This is probably some of the best training that I've seen to understand implicit bias, and it's totally free. You just go on there and you click the buttons and the videos start and the tutorials start and the next thing you know, you're understanding implicit bias. Microaggressions are subtle, indirect, or unintentional acts of discrimination. I'm going to give you an example of a microaggression right now. If there is myself, we'll say, white woman, walking down the street late at night and an African-American male approaches me and I cross the street out of concern for my safety, I have just microaggressed against that individual, right? Because I subconsciously made a determination that my safety was at risk, when for all the more I know, that person who was walking towards me was actually a professor at Vanderbilt. Now, put yourself in the shoes 
of the person who gets microaggressed on a daily basis. Imagine being the African-American male professor from Vanderbilt. You're on your way to work. You see this occurring. Sometimes you cross the street to avoid making other people uncomfortable. You start your day with the buildup of microaggressions. And then you get into work and you're really tired because microaggressions actually do cause stress and they cause damage. <laughs> and so you take a little bit longer at work than you expected. And so you don't leave until late night. You're now an African-American male on a college campus in the United States late at night walking down the street. How many microaggressions do you think you receive on the way home? Microaggressions are the thing that you hear about when you hear a death by a thousand cuts. That's what a microaggression is. Conscious or explicit bias is an intentional prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way that's considered to be unfair. Sexism is basically a biased based off of sex. Racism is a bias, prejudice, or stereotype or discrimination based off of race. Homophobia is a bias, prejudice, or stereotype based off of sexuality. This is the United States definition of harassment. There's something wrong with this definition. We'll get into it here in a second. But it is unwelcome conduct that is based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information. There is a group missing from this, which is sexual orientation and gender identity. That is not protected in the United States by federal law. It is protected here. It was added to the Constitution uh, for sexual orientation in 2003, I believe. It was at, actually, the first federal law was made in 2003. It was added to your Constitution in 2011. In 2013 is when gender identity was added, and it was added to your constitution in 2014. So this, is the legal definition in the US. this is the legal definition in the US. So what do these biases and harassment look like in STEM? Some of these for those in this room who um, deal with biases and harassment on a daily basis, these are gonna look familiar. STEM fields are shown to have implicit bias that is impactful to opportunities in mentorship, opportunities in the classroom, workplace conflict and stereotype issues. Women of color faculty in the United States have decreased even as white women faculty have increased. Women of color are more likely to be junior in rank. And in physics, women and women of color specifically are isolated and experience microaggressions in the workplace. White women and people of color are underrepresented in the physical sciences to a far greater degree than the biological or social sciences. We just saw that in the uh, charts on the academia slides before. And women and, color, women and persons of color experience more workplace incivilities. And this is all the peer-reviewed literature that can go with that, that I will have slides at the end of this and I will be sure to leave the slides with both Yilin and Anti so that you can all get a copy and read all of the literature that you want. And these biases actually have names. So the Matthew effect in STEM is that the most famous name gets all of the work attributed to them. Remember that typically women of color are more likely to be junior in rank. Just mentioned that. Lower status scientists are overlooked and their work attributed to their higher status colleagues. Those who actually coined this term are my greatest example of the Matthew effect in place. Bob Merton, I believe his name is Bob, but took, took credit for this in 1968 with credit to the work of Harriet Zuckerman, who was his student who did all of the data analysis and the work for this beforehand. So the Matthew effect, right there. Yes. Wow. Yep. The Matilda effect in STEM is that women in collaborations with their men, whether married or unmarried, typically receive less credit and men profit more from their discoveries. If you don't believe me, just ask a few Nobel Prize losers. <laughs> there have been major scandals and conversations about EDI within STEM and in particular, 
in the astronomical, astrophysical, astroeducational, and geophysical fields. Fields which all of you have had some sort of hand in. Um, and this has put STEM fields into discussions with not only major media outlets, but also congressional officials. I want to make this go a little bit closer to home today, though. This is this week's, came out today, right? Um, newspaper for UNAM. Yes, it is focused on um, gender violence here. I feel like this, this figure right here to me represents what I'm trying to say very, very well and make this hit home for you all. That this is not just a problem we have in the United States. This is not just a problem that we have in astronomy. This is not just a problem that we have in any one field. This is a large cultural issue. But we have the ability to get data, do science, and make real change. There's no reason why we shouldn't take advantage of that opportunity. So I've been discussing this topic for most of my life now, it seems like. And as I moved higher into the planetary science and astrophysics communities, um, I would push more on leadership and say, why aren't we having this conversation? Why aren't we talking about what policies need to be changed? Why aren't we being real about this? Why do I always have to talk at the women's lunch? Right? And they would always come back and say, well, you know the two people that are doing this. Or your data is anecdotal. Right? You don't have data to back up what you're actually saying. So I decided to work with another astrophysicist and two social scientists to get the data. We decided in 2015 to do the Committee on the Status of Women in Astronomy's Survey on Workplace Climate. 2017 papers mentioned there. What we did was we constructed a survey, which we actually adapted the survey of the LGBT physicist group from the American Institute of Physics. And we asked a bunch of questions regarding workplace climate. We relied heavily upon our social scientists to help us with the language crafting there, because I am not a social scientist. I am a phys physical scientist turned administrator guru. That is who I am now. <laughs> but um, I am the person who has the resources to recruit the population to be able to respond to this survey. So we adapted the survey. We got 39 questions. And we released this for only two months in 2015, January through March, right? We recruited through all of these major planetary science and astrophysics outlets in the United States, and we had over 400 astronomers and planetary scientists respond. That is the st statistically significant data set within social science. Furthermore, we had more people respond to our survey then vote for the chair of the Division of Planetary Sciences that year. More people cared to answer our questions than to vote for the leadership of the society. Here's our results. Now, we focus this on only your current position within the last five years, because social science shows that any sort of reflection upon beyond five years is skewed towards the positive or the negative. So we focused on within five years. And we asked whether or not folks had heard negative language, sexist, ableist, homophobic language, um, comments about accessibility, comments about religion, negative comments in those cases. And what we found out was that 88% of our respondents heard negative language from their peers, 52%, 51.9%, heard negative language from their supervisors who are trained to not do this. It's required by law in the United States for supervisors to be trained to not behave in this manner. And yet, here we are, over half doing it. And 88% were hearing negative language from others within their departments. In terms of harassment of those over 400 respondents, 39% reported verbal harassment and another 9% reported physical harassment. Now, we actually allowed folks to leave an email for us to contact them later for interviews, should they choose. This was anonymous, but they, could, they were allowed to de-anonymize themselves at a later date for us to follow up with them through a series of interviews. And one of the disturbing things that we found out from those interviews 
was that people were redefining physical harassment to mean physical assault. Actual groping, pushing, touching. So this number is conservative. Now, I know you're thinking, oh, well, you're just talking about 36 people, right? Name 36 people that you would like to have physically harassed or assaulted in your community. I, I don't care if this is smaller than, say, publication issues and publication charges. I'm pretty sure people are more important than publication charges. And what I'm telling you is that a percentage of the people in the United States planetary science and astronomical communities were being physically harassed. In terms of safety, sure. This is in the workplace environment. We very clearly stipulated in the workplace environment within the past five years in your current position. And we had definitions for these too. Although, again, people made it worse than actual just harassment. In terms of safety, we actually asked people, in your work environment, do you feel safe? And if you felt unsafe, have you skipped professional events due to feeling unsafe? 27% of our respondents felt unsafe in their work environment at one point or another in the past five years. And of those 27%, 11% had skipped at least one professional event because of feeling unsafe. Here's the thing about science. You can't become a successful scientist if you're not in the room. And if you don't feel safe being in the room, how can you get trained to become an amazing, awesome scientist? We are taking science away from people by them not feeling safe in the room. And there is statistically significant associations with skipping these events and feeling unsafe and experiencing verbal or physical harassment or hearing negative comments from peers and supervisors. So this is all statistically linked. What does this mean for career consequences to the climate at hand? Well, women of color face harassment in intersectional ways. 40% of women of color and 27% of white women in the sam sample felt unsafe due to their gender. 28% of women of color felt unsafe due to their race. 40% due to their gender, 28% due to their race. I'll let you do the math. This is a huge loss of professional opportunity for women generally and for people of color, particularly women of color. The negative climate is keeping the numbers low for women of color. You have an increase in the risk of stereotype threat you have an underestimation of performance, and you have a lack of critical mass in job searches. That's the one that I hear about the most nowadays is, oh, I'm running a job advertisement, but no women of color are applying to it. Have you stopped to ask whether or not your environment is actually inclusive and safe for a woman of color to apply to? Is this a safe place for women? Yes or no? I'm gonna note that these results focused on women of color. The next one from the title should tell you what's going to happen. Gender and sexual minorities in astronomy and planetary science face increased risks of harassment and assault. Again, this comes out on Monday, so I can't show you the results, but um, you should definitely check it out. Now, we're not the only ones who have done any sort of workplace climate survey. This is actually a huge field. And so instead of showing you each of the huge fields pieces, I wanted to show the personal part that I know well, and I wanted to show you some of the larger scale efforts that have been happening. The National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics, um, or medicine, uh, actually did a report on sexual harassment in academia in 2018. And their report showed that approximately 50% of women faculty and staff in academia in the United States experience harassment, sexual harassment, 50%, one and two. And between 20 to 50% of students in science, engineering, and medicine experience sexual harassment from faculty or staff. Not from other students, from faculty or staff. The big thing that I see here within their findings is that the organizational climate is by far the greatest predictor of the occurrence of sexual harassment. 
And if you work to get rid of it, you can prevent people from sexually harassing others. But if you ignore it, it's only going to stay or get worse. So this can't be ignored. The American Physical Society did a report on LGBT climate in physics in 2016. And they showed that LGBT physis physicists face uneven protections and support from legislation and policies in the United States. LGBT physicists with additional marginalized, additional marginalized identities, such as being black and gay, faced greater levels of discrimination. And transgender and gender non-conforming physicists encountered the most hostile environments. Okay, I just brought the room to a major Debbie Downer level. Y'all are a little bit like, right, why am I in this field? Um, no, this field is amazing. I wouldn't still be here if it wasn't, right? So I'm going to try to uplift us for a moment with some pictures of kittens and dogs and one of my favorite places. This is the Hilton Hawaiian Village in Waikiki. <laughs> um, these are my cats. This is Mobius with his little stuffed animals that he carries around the house. This is Gauss and this is Zizu. Um, I'm putting this up here to try to alleviate some of the tension in the room, because I know I'm turning slightly red and pink. You all can see it. I can see that you all have sunk even lower in the chairs in the last five minutes or so, and that's not why I'm here. It's not why I'm giving you this talk. Because if I thought this was something that we couldn't fix or change, I, again, probably would have just moved to the Hilton Hawaiian Village and lived out my life there on the beach somewhere potentially homeless because I wouldn't have a job, but whatever, you know? Um, but what I do wanna say is there has been some great change. There has been a lot of positive change and we are continuing to push forward and I want us to continue striving. When people ask for change from leadership, they are not saying that leadership sucks. They're not saying that you're terrible people. What they're saying is that there's a new standard of excellence that we want to be a part of. And we want to work to get to that standard of excellence. And then a new standard of excellence is going to be defined and you're going to continue to work to do that. But leaders are given that title for a reason. They are the leader of the community, meaning they are responsible for the entire community, their wants and wishes, right? So, I'll show a little bit from one of the, my favorite NASA missions right now, InSight. Rolling Stone did an article actually on the women of the InSight mission. I will mention that there is one um, male in this photo, baby Arthur here. This is Ingrid Dobar. She's one of the scientists that I work with. She's amazing. Um, Science Magazine did a feature on what does a scientist look like, and more children are drawing women now than ever before. And there are a lot of groups out there working to empower women and young girls to enter STEM. One of the ones that I work with in the Los Angeles area is Boundless Brilliance. Um, on Saturday, I will be working in a tent with a bunch of amazing women astronomers here from UNAM, um, and we will be motivating young girls across the city. So I'm really looking forward to it. So there's lots of, there's lots of push to move forward. Okay, so we talked about how you need workplace climate surveys to look at inclusion and equity. You need demographics to understand diversity. But the key next step is that you need to create recommendations followed by actual policies that have protocol and procedures that can be followed that actually impact EDI for the better. So here's some of the recommendations that have come from each of those different results I just gave you. So first up is from our Women of Color 2017 paper. Our recommendations for solutions to the problem was to educate on appropriate workplace behavior and to educate everyone, not just supervisors. Does everyone here get training in how to be a bystander? How to be impactful towards helping each other if you see something going wrong? Why? Why not? There's free programs online, I'll show you. <laughs> Uh, diversity and cultural awareness training are necessary to raise awareness 
and understanding of the problems faced by women of color and other underrepresented groups. Leaders need to model inclusive behavior and truly define inclusive culture. And when abuses are reported, instigators should be swiftly, justly, and consistently sanctioned. That always seems to be the part that's missing. If somebody is screwing up, if they're mucking up really bad, take care of it. Take care of your people, take care of your institution. That's, that is the bare minimum standard there. That's not the standard of excellence. That should be the bare minimum. Lawsuits come if you don't take care of that. There should be initiatives to increase numbers of women of color. You should build cohorts of women of color to enable creation of peer networks. You should encourage fair high practi hiring practices to minimize implicit bias. We'll get back to implicit bias training here in a sec. And you should incentivize departments who support women of color. The NASM report also had a very large list of recommendations. I recommend you go to the link and you look them all up. But we're going to focus on a couple. Leaders in academic institutions must pay increased in attention to and enact policies that cover gender harassment. This report was just on gender harassment. Some of the report members were asked, you focus solely on gender harassment, what about other forms of harassment? They're like, well, we were tasked to only focus on gender harassment, but I think we mean all harassment. Like, get policies that actually stop harassment. Move beyond legal compliance to address culture and climate. This is not about basic checkbox training. This is about making sure you have an environment where people feel truly welcomed and safe. And provide support for targets. Make sure that if somebody is being harassed, that there's someone there to have their back, to support them, to help guide them. If, if somebody is being sexually harassed by their PhD advisor, think of the fear that comes with that. That, that fear that I might not get to finish my dream because this is a terrible human being in front of me and they're in charge of all of my money and all of my data, all of my research facilities. Provide them support to be able to transition out of that dangerous environment and into a more productive, welcoming, safe environment. Yes, I do mean financial support. Yes, I do mean things like therapy. And improve transparency and accountability. Don't try to hide when you're dealing with these issues because everybody is dealing with them. And if you're hiding it, people know that you're hiding it. And you end up with protest papers like this. Sorry, I like having something to be able to hold while I'm here. <laughs> okay, the APS report. Its biggest thing that they recommend was to establish a safe and welcoming environment. They focused on meetings because that's what the American Physical Society does. Uh, they wanted to establish written best practices and implement a code of conduct. The LGBT plus physicist group and the sexual and gendered minorities and astronomy group of the American Astronomical Society got together and created what I think is the best document for any astronomy department to read. That is the LGBT plus inclusivity in physics and astronomy best practices a guide, second edition. Don't read the first, read the second. The first was only done by one of these groups and it has not nearly as much literature and not nearly as much work development going into it. So the second edition is awesome. It had a bunch of recommendations for how to make your environment truly inclusive and welcoming to the LGBT community and how to make it safe for the LGBT community. Those recommendations can actually be implemented across most diversity spectrums that are available. So I highly recommend everybody get a copy of this document. I highly recommend any leaders in the room print off this document and start a conversation about how you can pick just one to two simple little to-do items that are in it to pick them up and use them within your institution on a daily basis. Just one to two. I'm not asking for you to, to fully accept the entire best practices. I want you to. I, I, I wish somebody could model this into an entire institution's best practices guide and magically everything gets worked, but I'm asking for one to two. That's all. 
Here's some tips to do better. Number one, recognize that diversity is valuable. Diversity actually follow, fosters better solutions to problems because it combats things like groupthink. When you have everybody having the same idea always around each other, and then you have some sort of a problem get thrown into the middle of it, everybody comes up with the same solution, which doesn't always work. Think about this in terms of interdisciplinary research. I was actually talking with Patti today, one of the students, and we were talking about this really cool interdisciplinary science that she gets to do. She's studying meteorites for everybody to know. Uh, you're looking at the chondrules within them, correct? Yes. She is working with groups in uh, astronomy, in nuclear physics, in biology, in geophysics. Yeah, she's, she's working with groups throughout a whole bunch of different departments, and she was telling me about how fantastic it is to meet these different groups, work with these different tools, and learn all of these different skills. The more diverse your group, the more you're able to take advantage of tools and resources from the other groups, right? So let's think about that in terms of diversity of people as well. But proportionality matters when you talk about diversity. When you have a uniform group, which means that less than 15% of the group are minorities, the minorities behave like the, the majority. They go into survival mode. There is no impact on diversity whatsoever. When you're between 15 and 30%, this is when tokenism occurs. Tokenism is the practice of making symbolic efforts. It's the checkbox and the gold stars for diversity. This is when women get to hear things like, you only won that award because you're a woman. So it's symbolic, but there's backlash that occurs. So what you want to do is you want to try to get within the tilted group range, 30 to 50% of your population being underrepresented groups. The groups gain some benefit of diversity. Backlash can still occur, but the big thing is when you reach 30% of the room being diverse populations, implicit bias starts to get mitigated. Because suddenly what it looks like to be a physicist or an astronomer is a diverse group of people versus everybody already having this idea when they walk in the room of what is a successful astronomer or physicist. And balanced groups are when traditional minorities contribute equally and at ease. You should be following the 30% rule. Aim to have minorities make up at least 30% at each rung of the organization, at each part, each tier. Having 30% of your diversity population being students is not being very diverse at the leadership level. The leadership level is the group who actually puts out policies and procedures and directly impacts those students. So does your leadership level, the group who's making major changes in policy structure and power, the group with power, are they at 30%? That's what you should be aiming for. Here's some general tips to do better. Collect demographic information, use it to, to build your policies. Diversify your network. Uh, make sure your department, institutions, seminars, committees, panels have good diversity balance in terms of race, gender, uh, ability, right? Don't reinforce stereotypes when di diversifying. Um, one of the big things now whenever I do diversity talks is I make sure that I get to talk about my science too while I'm there. I come long enough to do both because I am also both an astrophysicist and a planetary scientist, and I'm a program manager for all the research and analysis at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I am not just a diversity guru. And we will acknowledge the existence of both of those human beings in one awesome person, right? So make sure when you're you're diversifying that you don't reinforce those stereotypes. Oh, well, we need to have a diversity seminar now. We're going to just bring women for that, and then we're going to count that for our diversity checkbox, right? Or we're going to have just the women organize the outreach events. Or we have this really big, important meeting happening. Can somebody work to make sure that we get coffee? Oh, well, of course it's going to be you, Yelin. No, I'm just, I'm just pointing to a human being I know in the room. I'm not saying that anybody's forced that, her to do that. If you have, you deal with me. <laughs> no. 
Uh, amplify your minority voices in the room during discussion. Foster and draw on mentorship roles and responsibilities. Mentorship gets overlooked in science. It does not get the credit that it rightfully deserves. And women of color, and women generally, are typically doing far more mentorship than men because they are considered the safe person to go to. It's far easier to turn to another underrepresented member of the community than it is to turn to somebody who's part of the majority. It takes a lot of work for a white man in the United States to become a strong ally to be trusted. I will say that right now. But understand that there is that burden on the women within the community. Make sure you're aware of unconscious implicit bias. Take the implicit bias test and then use implicit bias mitigation techniques for a more fair process. Again, I introduced to you earlier the Kerwin Institute, which has a great training module on implicit bias. I also recommend that you move towards a dual anonymous method of review. The Nature article linked above describes dual anonymous, but it's basically um, the person who puts forward their application, you don't know who they are, and the person who's reviewing it doesn't know who they are. It's based off of the science merit. You can do this at step one of hiring. Maybe not when you have to do in-person interviews, obviously, but step one, just getting to a short list, why not? And remember to account for all components of EDI when building your policies. Avoid making sexual remarks when in the work environment. I feel like everybody should know that, but I'm just gonna say it again. Don't make sexual remarks. Um, offer and take bystander intervention training. The Step Up program is a free program for bystander training that you can go and use. It was actually developed by the University of Arizona's Cat Life Skills Group, which is their athletic department. Uh, but there's a lot of fantastic training opportunities there. And lean into your discomfort. discomfort. Uh, it is the job of the individual who does not know these things to learn about benevolent sexism, mansplaining, and tone arguments, and to avoid these behaviors. It is not the job of underrepresented groups to teach you about these things. There's a thing called Google. You can look it up, right? I do this all the time, actually. I sit and listen to podcasts from underrepresented groups and try to understand, because hey, I'm a white woman. I know this about myself. It's my job to learn about whether or not I'm creating a culture, right? Know when to listen and don't belittle or dismiss someone. Absolutely beyond anything else, avoid victim blaming. And if you're somebody who's been doing this a really long time, maybe you're an ally, or maybe you're someone who's dealing with this yourself, you have to remember to put on your oxygen mask before assisting others. You have to remember to take breaks. You have to remember to self-care. This website that you see here on compassion fatigue is a self-test to see whether or not you have burnout. I highly recommend you take this. And if you see the results come back and you're worried about them, seek professional help. Seek help either from close friends that you trust or from professionals like therapists. But seek help. Combating negativity. You should really focus on combating negative thoughts within others by encouraging people, discouraging hostility and bickering, and by rewarding and encouraging people in your group for mentoring others. I'm gonna slip through these last few rather quickly because we are over time. All right. I want everybody real quick, I'm gonna end us on these. I want to hear from the audience. When you think of the times in your life when you've been the happiest, the proudest, or the most satisfied, what values come to mind? These words are in English, so I apologize, but shoot out some values to me. From the list? Yeah, it could be from the list or it could be your own. Excited. Excitement? Was that was? Yeah. Ex huh? Okay, yes. What else? Empathy. Huh? Empathy. 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 Freedom. Empathy. Happiness. Friendships, mine's helping others. Affection, men in the room. Inspiration, men in the room. I wanna hear about your feelings, come on. <laughs> Accomplishment. 
accomplishment. All right. Do you, in general, try to live up to these values? I'm not going to ask you to think about that out loud. But I want you to reflect why these are important to you, to yourself. And now I want to ask the next question. When you think of your career as a scientist, researcher, or educator, which values come to mind? Empathy. Empathy. Honesty. Honesty. Mine's helping others. Inspiration. Creativity. Community. Community. The words are slightly different between the two. Have we noticed that? They're mostly the same, but they're slightly different. Uh, I've noticed when I do this at a highly technical group, um, the words are completely different. If I do this at the American Astronomical Society meeting. If I do this at a conference that's focused on EDI, on bringing underrepresented people into the room, the words stay mostly the same. And so I asked out loud once, why? And someone responded to me quite cleverly, cleverly with, do you ever think it's because I need my values on a day's, daily basis just to survive? Think about that. Think about how you bring your values with you to work on a daily basis. Because this, this right here is not just some other thing you do for eight to 10 hours a day and then you go home, right? We got into our fields because this is something we love to do. This is something that you're embracing. When you sit there and you hold out your hand and you think of your research, you think of some of the joyful moments of that research. I want everyone in this room to practice doing that. And I want to ask, what should the values of your institution and department be? And who should get to decide what those values are. How can you ensure those values are followed within the practices and policies of your institution or organization? And with that, I'm going to put up an additional resources slide and say thank you. And we are running over, so if somebody has to sprint out, I will not be offended. Sí,